good to see everyone this morning. We're going to be studying uh, Jesus' first miracle. Before we do that, we'll talk about what I didn't get to cover last week was uh, preparation of his ministry, which this miracle also was preparation of his ministry, early ministry. And so we're going to talk about that. First, we're going to go to John chapter 1. That's where we're going to be. John chapter 1. We'll start reading at uh, verse number 35. John chapter 1 and beginning at verse 35. It's sure good to see everybody here. Got a lot of smiling faces this morning. I know that everyone's glad to be here. I got to make sure Jeannie's okay. Yeah, she's smiling. Good to see everybody. Before we begin our study this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blessing and privilege we have to meet here together as a family. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this country that we're, we live in. We're thankful for the blessings that you have provided. And Heavenly Father, we pray for our men and women in uniform that you'll watch over them and protect them, bring them home safe. And dear Lord, we ask that you bless each member present. And we pray for those that are unable to be here, they're in their homes or in the nursing homes or hospitals, we ask, Lord, that you strengthen them, that you be with them and give them comfort and help their good health to return and help us as their brothers and sisters to go visit them and encourage them in every possible way. Lord, we're thankful for our elders. We're thankful for the leadership they provide this congregation. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for their wisdom and their knowledge, and we ask that you continue to help them build up their knowledge and their willingness to serve you. We're thankful for our deacons and the hard work that they perform every day for this congregation. And Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for your plan of salvation. And Lord, most of all, we're thankful for your son that was sacrificed on the cross for our sins. And dear Lord, we ask that you forgive us of any sins and help us through each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Good to see everybody. John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 35. Um, John follows a chronological order of events. And so we're going to study first the early preparation of his ministry. And here in John chapter 1, beginning at verse 35, he's selecting some of his apostles. And then we'll go straight into his first miracle. Uh, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour, which is about four o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the twelve one of the two, excuse me, who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You're Simon, son of Jonah. 
you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now let me stop right there and let's go back. Let's go back to verse number 30, uh, verse 35. Again, the next day, and all, all the way through 37, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples that heard him speak, what did they do? They were John's followers, John the baptizer's followers. What did they do? They, they started following him, didn't they? And so one of the disciples of those two was Andrew, and we know that from verse 40. And the other one is believed to be the apostle John. We don't know that for sure, but it, it's, it's pretty accurate. John the baptizer points those two disciples to Jesus, and, and he's pointing out to them the Savior of the world. And they followed Jesus, verse 37. What was John the baptizer doing? When he was doing that he was preparing the way he was the one that would be pointing others preparing them for the coming of the savior of the world verse 38 then jesus turned and seeing them following said to them what do you seek and they said to him rabbi or teacher where are you staying and they followed him. They wanted to be with him, didn't they? They knew that he was special. John the Baptist had pointed out to him, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so they asked him where he was standing, verse 39, and he says, well, Come and see. And so they did. They went and saw where he was staying, and they remained there until, or it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they did that. Um, verse 40 and one of the two who heard him speak followed and followed him was Andrew there it goes that's where it's revealing him Andrew Simon Peter's brother and Andrew has just found the Christ and immediately what's the first thing he wants to do go tell his brother go find his brother and tell him verse 41 Good message for us right there, Purcell. The one who has found Jesus has found what? Even today. The one who finds Jesus has found what? Yeah, he's found everything. Everything. It makes anything else in this world that we have and want and seek and desire nothing. Nothing. If you found Jesus, you found everything. And that's what their attitude was. He brings his brother to him. And uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah, verse 41. He immediately recruited his brother. Then he told Peter, we have found the Messiah or the Christ. They had been waiting how many years? A lot of years. <laughs> Thousands of years. They've been waiting for the Messiah, the Savior of the world, to come into the world, and that's what they've been waiting for. And now it has happened right here. Can you imagine if you were alive then and you were with them and you saw John, you had been following John and staying right with him, and all of a sudden John tells you, Behold the Lamb of God, and you're standing on the Jordan River, and you see that, you want to go with him. You want to find out what's going on. You want to know the whole story. We would do the same thing. There's not a dime's worth of difference between those people and us. They would want to do the same thing. We would want to do the same thing. Go with him. Find out more. And so when he brought him to Jesus in verse 42, Jesus looked at him and he said... You are Simon, son of Jonah, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Cephas is the Aramic word that means the same thing as the Greek word Peter, which is a rock or a small stone. 
Is that pretty uh, indicative of the way Peter was when he first became a, a follower of Jesus, when he first became a disciple? You know, he had a lot of problems, just like we do. He's a great study. If you want to study something, I know you know this, but if you want to study something you can actually get right into, it's him because he is like us. And, you, and it's revealed all the way through. He made mistakes, but he got back up. And he didn't wind up a small stone, did he? No. He became a rock. A rock. That's what happens when you follow Jesus. You become that rock. And he did. He became the rock. Uh, verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him in verse 48, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And then verse 51 says, And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. Of man. Verse 43. The following day, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and so he found Philip and he said to him, Follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And he tells Philip what? What does Jesus say to Philip? Follow me. Follow me. Philip lived in the same place as Andrew and Peter. And so in verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael was a Galilean. And we know that from John 21 and verse 2. He came from Cana of Galilee. And what does he say? <laughs> Anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there anything good in Texas for somebody coming from Corsicana? Means the same. Why not big Dallas? Why not big Austin? Huge San Antonio. Can anything good come out of Corsicana? They can, can't they? <laughs> can't they? Yes, they can. And that's what he said. How can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's just a little bitty city, a little old bitty town, a little old bitty village. Why not Jerusalem? The big educational center where all them religious leaders are. Why not Jerusalem? Nazareth? <laughs> just an obscure little village? But... The best way to answer a skeptic is done right here. What does he say? Come and see. You want to answer a skeptic, that's what you would say. Come on, come and see, I'll show you. Come and see. It's probably a great message for us today, isn't it? Come and see. Come and see what we do. Come and see how we worship. I'll ex we'll explain it all to you. Come and see. 
verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. To me, this is, this is what this is saying. He, he's saying that this is that he is represented as the best that could be produced under the Old Testament system. Nathaniel saw him in verse 48. How do you know me? How do you know? Jesus told him before, Philip called you, you were where? Under a fig tree. I wonder why he's under that fig tree. Is he? Was he just trying to get some shade? I'm, we're just speculating here. I don't have a, really a clue. I'm just. This is speculation. This is not God's word. I'm speculating. I'm using my imagination. That's what I'm doing. I'm sorry. Maybe he was after some figs. Maybe he wanted the shade. Or maybe there's another possibility. Maybe he had been and, and heard about Jesus. He, you know, all the countless numbers of people were going to the Jordan River to see John the Baptist, and they were being baptized by John in the Jordan. And maybe he, he, he heard about all that, or maybe he was standing on the Jordan, and he heard, Behold the Lamb of God. We don't know. Maybe he was sitting under that fig tree contemplating about all this. And Jesus knew that. I do not know. No one knows. But he's under this fig tree. And Jesus said, I saw you. Before Philip called you, I saw you under that fig tree. Verse 49. Nathaniel and answered, and Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are what? King of Israel. This is the good confession, isn't it? Reminds us of another good confession. What was it? Peter's confession. Peter's confession. You are truly the Son of God. Peter's confession. Reminds us the same thing. This was the good confession too. <clears throat> and then uh, verse 50 oh, uh, by the way that's uh, Matthew 16 and verse 16 Simon Peter his good confession Matthew 16 verse 16 verse 50 Jesus answered and said to him because I said to you I saw you under the fig tree do you believe you will see greater things than these Nathaniel was amazed, wasn't he? Nathaniel was absolutely amazed. He, uh, Jesus knew he was a skeptical at, at first, but now Nathaniel knows that he is someone special. In fact, what does Nathaniel say? What does Nathaniel believe who he is? Who does he believe who he is? You are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You are the king of Israel, he says. You are the son of God. Nathaniel was amazed, and what did Jesus tell him? We would say the same thing today, the same words, if we were putting it in our words. You ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. Of what are you going to see once you follow me and stay with me? Verse 51. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Remember Jacob's dream in Genesis verse 28 and verse 12? Remember that? Genesis chapter 28 and verse 12? Jacob's dream, he saw a ladder going to heaven. And what did he see going to heaven? Back and forth. Angels descending and ascending. Back and forth. Well, guess what? Jesus is the ladder. He's our ladder. He is the ladder. 
and he and he is our communication with our God and Father in heaven. He is the ladder. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it did, didn't it? Because the uh, high priest said, are you really the Christ? And he said, yes. What are y'all waiting on? They told him, and they, and they tore their clothes because he made that confession. Philip, talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, riding in the chariot, he's reading Isaiah 53. He don't understand what he's reading. So Philip takes the scripture right there at Acts chapter 8 and beginning at Isaiah 53, preaches Jesus to him, which was the gospel, which was a requirement to be baptized for the remission of your sins. We know this because he had to stop the chariot. What hinders me now from being baptized? And he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And so him and Philip went down into the water. He baptized him for the remission of his sins. He comes up out of the water. Philip goes on, and the Ethiopian eunuch rejoices. And he made that good confession, didn't he? I left that out. That's what I was coming to. <laughs> I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now let's move to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Any other comments? John chapter 2. <clears throat> I've been uh, I've been thinking about this for this whole week, this past week. Jesus turning pure water into wine. And I'm going to talk about something first. I want to get it out of the way. I had family members that tried to show this to me and try to justify what they do. And it's upsetting to me. And I'd rather just get this out of the way so it doesn't detract from this wonderful miraculous event in, that he did and he overcame nature in the blinking of an eye. And, and what I want to talk about for just a few seconds <clears throat> is the wine aspect of this miracle. So when we study this miracle, we don't let that detract from what Jesus did here. In Palestine, there were three kinds of wine, three kinds of wine that was commonly used. The first was the unfermented juice of the grape. The second was fermented wine. It contained a small percentage of alcohol, very little, mixed with two and three parts of water. And then you had the third kind. Who wants to tell me what the third kind was? An intoxicating drink. Did they, what did they call it? New wine. That's what they called it. I, you remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when they... Uh, when all the apostles there and all of those people came from all these different countries from all over the known world and they're there in Acts chapter 2 and when uh, they begin to speak and in and, and Acts chapter 2 and verse 13 they say uh, some of them believed but some of them were mocking and then what were they saying? Acts chapter 2 and verse 13 and others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now listen I am not going to try to guess what kind of wine this was. But <laughs> I believe that, the, that this wine that Jesus made would have been the kind that would not have been and that is strongly condemned in the New Testament and the Old Testament. It would not have been that kind of wine. It's strongly condemned. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. That's one place. New Testament. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. And do not be drunk 
with wine. And then if you went on over, I'll let you look at it later. Proverbs 23, beginning at verse 30, 30 through 35. So it couldn't have been. That would have been against God to have that kind of wine. And another thing, distilled alcohol did not come along for another thousand years to our time. Yet there are many in my family that use this to try to justify their social drinking. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's right Dan thank you appreciate that you're exactly correct there is no justification from Jesus amazing miracle that he performed for social drinking of alcohol there is no justification in all my years I have never known, and I bet you can say the same thing, there, I have never known in all my years anything good that become of it. Nothing. Nothing good come from social drinking of al alcohol. Nothing ever good comes of it. Instead, everything bad, Dan, everything bad, Daryl, <laughs> comes out of it. Ruined lives, Ruined careers, health problems, ruined marriages, broken homes, child abuse, millions in damages of personal property, millions of innocent lives lost on the highways, and on and on and on it goes. There is no justification to me. Now that we got that out of the way, let's look at this amazing Tremendous miracle. Before we go on, I always, I've always thought about this. If that was intoxication and Jesus gave it to someone and they left there and did something bad and terrible, Jesus would be part yes, sir. of that bad and terrible event. And Wouldn't go happen. For everything that Jesus stands against. Yes, sir. My family does. <laughs> I can't. Isn't that the truth? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. Both of you. Appreciate it very much. Now we're ready for the real miracle. Verses 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and they ran out of wine. And the mother said to, Je said to him, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, whatever he says to you, whatever he says to you to uh, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. I, I got a tongue twister there. Pardon me. Now there was, <laughs> now there were set six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And he took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made with wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants had drawn the water new, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And then when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, and you have kept the good wine until now 
this beginning of signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. I'm, I'm gonna, now we're ready. Verse 1 and 2. On the third day, on the third day, here's this wedding. And it's in Cana of Galilee where Nathanael lives. And the mother of Jesus was there. And so now we have the mother of Jesus, and now both Jesus and his disciples have been invited to the wedding. Three days later, after Nathanael had followed him, here's this wedding. It's a small village. It's about nine miles of, from Nazareth. It, it's Nathanael's home. We talked about in John chapter 21, verse 2. Jesus' mother's in, in attendance. I think there's going to be several reasons I want us to look at that. But the first thing that comes to my mind she hadn't seen Jesus. Where had he been? He, he, he had been for, gone 40 days and 40 nights. He, he had been gone over a month. Where, where was he? He was in the, being tempted by the devil. And then he's at the Jordan River, and he's, he, he's being baptized before he went into the temptation. And I just wonder if she heard all that. I wonder if somebody, some friend of hers, family member told her he went to the Jordan, he was baptized by John the Baptist. I saw a dove coming from heaven, which was in the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that lighted on him. And, and also the uh, voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, they may have told her all of this. She didn't know she wasn't with him. I don't know. But she's in attendance at this wedding, and you know she's glad to see him. Jesus and his disciples. It may have been a wedding of a close friend or a family. We don't know because the only indication is that because Mary can tell the servants what to do. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. But they have a problem. They're out of wine. Verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, Jesus, we have no wine. The wedding celebration back then would last for several days. And so Mary goes up to Jesus and says, we have no wine. This amounts to a social catastrophe <laughs> for the families of the bride and the groom. I don't know about you, but I can picture this whole event in my mind. I see it unfolding. I see it happening. I even see the water pots leaning against the wall. Do you? They have no wine. The first thing I think about here, you don't know where Joseph is. And it's only natural that Mary tell her oldest son, we have no wine. We, she, she goes to him with the problem. Mothers down through the ages, down through the ages, mothers have relied on their sons. Beverly has always relied on our two sons. If, uh, if I wasn't around, I was gone somewhere working, then she would go to those two sons. You got to help me. I've got a problem. How many mothers down through the ages, including today, have gone to their sons and still do when there's a problem that arises? That's, that's what I think about when I, when I look at this, plus the fact that she feels that Jesus can do what? He can do something about it. He, he is capable. She knows about him. He is capable of doing something about this problem. Think about all the things she kept in her heart. Think about what, when the angel said, or the, uh, the, the priest said, you're going to be pierced through. Your soul is going to be pierced for sorrows. She thought about that. Think about when, uh, when uh, Joseph, the angel told Joseph, 
she's going to have a son and you're going to call his name Jesus and he's going to save the people from their sins and think about when the angel came to Mary told her she was going to have a baby and it was going to be from God and he would be the son of God think about all those things she had in her heart there she knew all of that and she had that and so in her heart she knows he can do something about this problem now I want you to look at something verse 4 Jesus said to her woman what does your concern have to do with me my hour has not yet come now we would think right off in today's terms but woman is not like we use it today sometimes. It's more of an affectionate and respectful word. Plus, he, did, he would have never been disrespectful to his mother. But it was a gentle, respectful term that he used. And he used the same thing when he was on the cross. In John 19 and verse 26, he said, Woman, behold what? Your son. So when we look at this today, instead of saying, oh my, he doesn't, it doesn't matter to him. Your, your concern, it's no concern of mine. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to do anything. I don't believe that's how it is. He didn't refuse to do anything. And I believe that she could tell by the tone of his voice, which we don't know what that was. Jesus' earthly family wasn't wealthy. And more than likely, this is not a wealthy wedding. This may have been one that I'm used to, low-budget one. Either way, it's embarrassing to the family. Verse 4, Jesus says, My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. It's not time yet, he's telling her, for the full manifestation of my glory for the full manifestation of me being Christ, the Savior of the world, it's not time yet to perform all these miracles I'm going to do as a declaration that I am the Messiah. It's not time yet. He also used that term in other ways. In, in John chapter 7 and verse 30, when they sought to kill him, it says, therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid hand on him because his hour had not yet come. When he's saying his hour had not yet come, in this instance, it's not time for his death on the cross or his resurrection. That time hadn't come. John chapter 8, verse 20, also John 13, verse 1. Now, notice what Mary does next. She knew that he could and would do something. Why don't we say that? Because of verse 5. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. He, she knew that he was going to help. Mary didn't see Jesus' words as a refusal, a rudeness, a refusal to help. She knows that he's in a position. She has all of those thoughts in her heart and she tells her servants to those servants to do what he said to do. Verse 6. Now there were six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, amen. can. You're exactly right. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone else? 
I'm sorry. Yeah, she turned the problem over to him, didn't she? Because she, she knew he could do something and he would do something. You're right. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. She was, wasn't she? You're exactly correct. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I, I, I just, I'm like all of you. I love this part. <laughs> I love that. Yes, mothers don't take no for an answer, do they? <laughs> so here's a picture now. He, John wants us to see this. He wants us to see, in verse 6, these six water pots laying against the, the building, made of stone. They're used for purification of the Jews. John was an eyewitness to this, and, and he wants us to see this, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you in a minute why he wants us to see this. But these pots were handmade. They vary in size of how much liquid it would hold. My Bible said 20 or 30 gallons apiece. That's a total of 120 to 180 gallons of water. Now, some versions, some Bibles doesn't give you that size because it varies. But the main thing we can know for sure is the Lord is going to do what with that water? He's going to change it in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. He's going to change it. And so John wants us to see, right now I think he wants us to see that water, all that water, that he's going to make wine from just plain water. It takes a lot of water. Yes, sir. I believe that's exactly why John wanted us to see those water pots over there and why he said it was for Jewish purification because the Jews used this pure and you're exactly correct that's exactly what I was fixing to talk about you're exactly right thank you Paul the, the, the purification of the Jews it was Jewish tradition not God's word Jewish tradition, the traditions of men. What did Jesus say about the traditions of men? They're going to be done away with. They're, they're not right. They're sinful. And so the Jews had gotten so carried away with purification that they washed their hands before the meal. They washed their hands in between courses. They washed their hands after the meal. They even washed all the pots and all the pans and all of that. And it, what, what the point is, it took lots of water for them. And so he wants us to see that because that's all going to be taken out of the way. Because there's going to be a new covenant. If you want to look later at Mark chapter 7, verse 1 through 7, make a note of it. Mark chapter 7, verse 1 through 7, he's going, he talks about the Jewish how the traditions of men, how, how they washed everything, and that explains all of that. And so in verse 7 and 8, Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out some now, and, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it to him, verse 7 and 8. And then they take it to the master of the feast. And the master of the feast is usually uh, Jewish weddings lasted for... They may, they may last several days, and, and so they, it, usually one person serves as, as the master of the feast. Is that what happens today? 
when we have weddings, we pick out a master of the feast. We pick out somebody in charge that will make sure everything flows normal, that every, we got plenty of seating, and on and on it goes. So it was customary at that time that the better wine be served first and then the everyday wine served later. But Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who created the world and all nature, created the grape that men take and turn into wine, produce it. But Jesus controls all of nature. And he did this process of turning absolute pure water into wine in an instant, in a blinking of an eye. It's just phenomenal, miraculous. And he did it without what? <laughs> I'm a, it's, not, it's not a trick question. He made that wine in an instant without what? Grapes. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, that's a joke. I'm, I'm kidding you. But he did. He didn't use grapes. He, he went above nature because he created nature. And so he turned pure water into wine. Verse 9 and 10. The master of the feast tasted the wine. And he says, hey, what's the deal? You don't do this. But who knew else in, in, that, in that verse 9 through 10? Who else knew what Jesus had done? The servants, they were right there. And then so he calls the bridegroom. And he, the master of the, of the feast calls the bridegroom and says, as normal custom, <laughs> we don't do this. We serve the good wine last or first but you've you've kept it back for last and here we have no idea if the bridegroom knew what he was talking what he was talking about we don't know but there were plenty of eyewitnesses who did know exactly what jesus did his power over nature it was his first miracle and it was done in an instant now look what look what the final results are Verse 11, the beginning of signs Jesus did in the Cana of Galilee manifested his glory, and who believed in him? His disciples, they needed this. They needed to see this. And also he helped his mother. <laughs> Any questions or final comments? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Amen. That's exactly right. Anybody else? Well, we'll you should have been a wonderful class. He's here, just as we can be you and bring the world.